politics, public education, and a lot of great stories. Got a treat for you. Caroline Romer is in the house. We got a lot to talk about. Roll it, Ed. She has been one of the most influential people in Louisiana fighting for children in schools. But she is also the daughter of our former governor, Charles Buddy Romer. And I tell you what, Caroline, having you here in studio is fun. So everybody in the in the studio has already gotten the Caroline Romer <laughs> treatment, especially Mel, but he had it coming. And so we're going to talk about what you've been doing as of late. But I want to begin because this year we lost uh, Governor Romer, buddy, who was, as you know, a good friend of mine. Yes. I would run into him all the time. He was uh, governor of Louisiana from 88 to 92. Uh, that was after spending seven years in the U.S. House and Harvard MBA and businessman, father, grandfather, the whole nine. But if I'd ask you to start by describing Buddy in a phrase or a couple of phrases, what would you say? A mm, couple things come to mind. One, lover of Louisiana. He was probably one of the biggest, biggest champions yeah. of the state. Loved it here. But our family motto is often wrong, never in doubt. <laughs> so we'll run our mouths a lot, and we will absolutely believe everything we're saying. But sometimes maybe we don't always get it right. So where does all of that tenacity come from? Because anybody who knows you or Chaz or Buddy, we know the Romer way. So yeah. where, is that, where does that come from? You know, from? Dad grew up in a family with five siblings, yeah. a farm, a yeah. cotton. Taylor and, Town? Yeah, yeah, cotton and soybean farm in North Louisiana with parents who deeply believed in education. And every night they would set the table for family dinner, and you better come prepared for the debate. So <laughs> we were not afraid to debate, to argue, to discuss. And so it just it's what he grew up with, and he passed it along to to Chaz and my brother Dakota, and we, we carry it on. So watching him transition into politics from rural North Louisiana and how that process went, what what, what was that like? Because he was, like I said earlier, he's an educated man. Watching that, what was it like? Yeah, you know, again, growing up in North Louisiana, it was probably not the norm to send your kids to Harvard. <laughs> um, but again, his parents really believe there's a big world out there. There's lots of ideas. There's lots of great things going on, go out there, learn about it, mm -hmm. and bring it back. And so he did come back and really felt strongly that a way he could impact Louisiana was two ways. He was a banker, mm -hmm. loved his banking business, and he believed in public policy and that there were um, times and there was a need for leadership in that. He was not he was not a politician that, you know, did mm -hmm. this kind of thing. He was a politician that believed, I, I like to think of him as more of a statesman, that again, he led people. He didn't do what he thought everyone wanted him to do. Right. I think he tried to make decisions that he thought was best for Louisiana, that best for the people of Louisiana. And sometimes that wasn't always really popular. I mean, he was only governor for four years because of some of those well, decisions. Well, and that's the thing that I wanted to ask about with that. And he, he kind of went his own way and didn't really test the air, but it did put him in trouble with a lot of people in the legislature who did not like that. What was that part like? Yeah, I mean, again, when you're in politics, a lot of that is the schmooze, work mm -hmm. in a room, and God, trying to please that. everybody. He did yeah. not enjoy that. He was he was great one-on-one, -on -one, one of the most amazing speakers I've mm -hmm. ever heard. Um, but his joy was not in the politicking. His joy was in problem solving and trying to, again, move Louisiana forward. And he felt very passionately, very strongly that we had some things that needed to be addressed, whether right. that was, you know, ethics, mm -hmm. our environment. He thought the politics here had been wrong for a long time, and he was willing to lead on those things knowing that it might be unpopular, uh, that he would, I think he had an ad that said, I, I make some people angry. He made a lot of people angry, but I'm really proud of his legacy. And I do think he planted the seeds for some of the things that later governors like Bobby Jindal and his ethics and mm -hmm. his reform were able to get done. So, you know, it was tough. It's, it's, 
anyone serving in elected office, it is very difficult. You can please some of the people some of the time, right. never all the people all the time. And it's very, I respect people that go out there and do it, but I, I fear that too many people worry about getting reelected yep. versus about making decisions that again will move us forward as a state. What did he hate the most about it? Mm, that's a good question. Probably the politicians. <laughs> you know, like he was not very good at building those um, collaborative, right. you know, teams at the legislative level. Uh, he came in as a reformer and the legislature was not quite there yet. There right. were some good guys and, 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 and women there at that time, but overall they were not quite ready for some of the things that he was you know, uh, touting, and I, I would say he just, he hated that part. Well, we'll come back and, and talk more about the legacy of Governor Romer and what Caroline is doing right now. Stay there, back in just a moment. Back with Caroline Romer, and we were going into break talking about politics and the nature of how that is. And during the commercial break, you and I were kind of talking about something that the average Louisiana might not guess. And it is most people who have spent any time in the state capitol don't really like being in that building. Talk about that. You know, again, I have some dear friends in that building. There are some great leaders in that building. but to be there on a day-to-day -day basis. I've right. been doing my job for 14 years, right. so I've sat through a number of House Education, Senate Education Committee meetings, and it's just not a fun place to be. It's very contentious. You would think talking about education is an opportunity mm -hmm. to really visit about ideas and to celebrate students and teachers, but it's one of the most contentious subjects. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't even want to serve on education right. committee because our meetings go hours long. It is angry. It is, again, it's, it's, it's a fight too often, and that's unfortunate. I want to take my time working towards today and transition a little bit to you now, growing up here in Louisiana, what shaped the Caroline Romer that we see today? Oh, well, I have, um, I have two parents that are uh, very um, passionate and <laughs> insistent uh, that Louisiana is this amazing place and that we have an obligation to give back. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was not raised in a, in a fashion where it was all about finding that job that pays gigantic 
salaries right. and all of that and the big houses and all that. It was more like, what can you do to help make this a better place to be? Mm -hmm. And so um, throughout my life, I watched um, both my mom and my dad uh, get up every day and go to work and go there with a passion and core beliefs, mm -hmm. like principles, and really stick to those principles. And they were not wafflers. They were not people that, again, I, I keep saying, they didn't look around to see what others were doing. I like to think of them as leaders in, in, in the work they were doing, and that just influenced me and, and my brothers. And uh, we continue, again, to do work that I, I like to believe is trying to make Louisiana, a place where more people uh, can raise their families and stay mm -hmm. here and have success and be happy. You know, finding your passion is so important because when you do, the money and all that stuff generally will find you anyway. Uh, but I'd like you to elaborate on that because I'm, I'm very into motivating people to figure out their, their, their place here. So my favorite actor of all time is Denzel Washington. Oh, I think I he's, just, he's, he's the greatest. And he's in a movie and he says this line that I've repeated a lot of times he says the two most important dates in a person's life is the day they're born and the day they find out why mm. right I like that so when did you find your why you know that is a great question um, I'm not a spring chicken I'm probably like a <laughs> fall somewhere in there um, and I spent a lot of my life in politics, managing campaigns, and not in Louisiana. I went all around the country working in politics, and I was good at it. Yeah. It's what I'd grown up watching and being a part of. But there was a day, um, probably about 15, 16 years ago, where frankly, I'm just like, I don't wanna be working for a candidate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're humans, they, they make mistakes, they fail, they say one thing and do something else. I said, there's gotta be more to this. It just didn't feel good. It didn't give me joy. And I came home, I actually moved back to Louisiana and started looking around trying to figure out what I could be a part of, mm -hmm. and that's when I landed on Charter Schools and Education. Well, I, I, we're going to take a quick break, but I want to come back to that because this work is so essential to the future of Louisiana. We're talking with Caroline Romer, one of my favorite people, and you're watching The Clay Young Show on WBRZ+. Not very often you get to hear a Denzel quote dropped 
You're welcome. We're talking with Caroline Romer about what you're doing now in Louisiana and your work in public education and getting to this point you were saying going into break that coming home you, you, or you, you get home, you decide, I want to do something different, mm -hmm. and then you chose this. But what was the mechanism that got you to choose this? Yeah, so I actually came, I was living in Denver, Colorado, and I came back right after Katrina and yeah. decided I'm going to live in New Orleans. I'm a North Louisiana girl. I hear bad stories about New Orleans, but I want to go there and, and see, see for myself what's happening there, be part of hopefully bringing that city, city back. And so while I was there, again, the politician in me starts looking around like what's going on around here, and I heard about charter schools yeah. and started seeing what was going on in their education landscape. And just really bluntly, I kind of dug around and saw that they had no association, they had no one as their advocate. Mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of skills. <laughs> My oh, skill okay. is as well. <laughs> my skills are it is, you know, acorn doesn't fall far from the tree. It's <laughs> yeah, politics right. and advocacy and understanding how to move issues and, right. and be a voice. And so I approached some folks in New Orleans that were heavily engaged. Actually, New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. Rolf McAllister mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. in Baton Rouge mm -hmm. was very engaged in the charter community. And I said, this is what I'm thinking about. And they're like, sounds great. So that's been 14 years ago, started right. the association and I um, love it. Uh, I feel like the work we're doing, which is really about promoting and supporting charter schools and informing in particular parents about what it means to have education choice, I love it. You asked uh, the Denzel, the why. The why, yeah. You know, I said to you at break, I think unfortunately a lot of people, their why is because they have to. Mm -hmm. um, my why is because I, I love this, right. I want to. And again, I remember often wrong, never in doubt. <laughs> it does not mean that I am perfect or that everything I'm saying right. is the silver bullet, but I love the opportunity to talk about what's possible in education because I really think that if Louisiana does not get education right, mm -hmm. we will continue to be at the bottom of every list. And I know there's a lot more to it than yeah. just the classroom, but so much is in that classroom. So answer this for me. We have been in deep discussion about education on a higher level since the 80s, and a lot of things have transpired in Louisiana that were supposedly going to benefit public education. And here we are now in 2021, saying basically the same, same. things. How is that possible? Yeah, you know, when my- Or why, why is that Yeah, possible? when dad ran for governor in 87, one of his big stump speeches was about education and wanting kids to be able to find good jobs here and stay at home mm -hmm. and he talked about things like you know um, teacher evaluations all those things and we continue to do it I don't know I think some of it is we have a lot of grown-ups and these are jobs mm -hmm. it's a some would even call it a jobs program more than it is about figuring out how to educate kids I think Overall, we have really good people inside our school buildings who want to work with kids and do the right thing, but unfortunately, we also have a lot of politics mm -hmm. in our building. That's what I always say. I think the problem with education is as much about the politics. Right. We need to allow teachers, educators, principals, parents to make decisions as close to kids as possible, free from the politics. Tell schools what we want them to do. What is the expectation? give them the resources they need to do it and get out of the way. Right. Instead, we kill them with a thousand paper cuts, a mm -hmm. bill here, a bill there. We've treated schools like we need to cram all these other things beyond just education into that building. And what I mean by that is things like, oh, we need to teach about, you know, drivers, you know, texting is bad. Um, or we need to teach them about um, not littering. Well, there's only so much in a day, <laughs> right. and I appreciate all those issues, right. but we really need to get back to allowing teachers to do what they do, and that's teach kids, and all the other stuff needs to go someplace else. Well, you were talking earlier about the, the percentage of children who cannot read on level by the third grade and how it's, it's egregiously high. Yeah, and the majority. The, the vast majority. So I like to focus on work in poorer communities across 
the the state and you know we've got a little less than a minute left and and I want to come back and talk with you about that because I think the way we fix a lot of what's happening in inner city communities uh, rural communities out in north and other parts of Louisiana is by fixing what happens in the classroom yeah giving the children an opportunity to find their why and not make it about grown-ups who just want to keep the money totally totally agree and giving them the resources in those classrooms kids that come from economically disadvantaged families mm -hmm. they have greater needs right. and we need to work on how we fund our schools and how those resources follow the students that need it the most all right so we'll take a break and we'll come back and talk more about this with caroline romer i told you you guys are going to enjoy it back in just a moment Is it really wrong to think about public education in the same ways that you think about business or operating a corporation? I don't think it is, but there are lots of people who don't want it to be seen that way. So Caroline, make the case that that is not a wrong paradigm to have. I, I think it's the right one. I think when you think about competition, business and competition mm -hmm. so when you have competitors in a landscape so that you have to work really hard mm -hmm. you have to focus on your customer you have to deliver a quality you know product mm -hmm. or that customer goes someplace else that's right i don't have a problem thinking about school that way or, or that is the charter that's the charter model it's a choice it's and a if choice. you don't do it well i'm going to choose to go someplace else so todd graves is a really good friend of mine and i did an interview with him for something else uh, a few weeks ago and when you talk with him he's not interested in chicken fingers and as and he is interested obviously in his product but he's more interested in culture and the culture that he wants created and no matter what raisin canes you go into that culture is the same mm -hmm. there the, the the engagement everything about it is culture schools on the other hand can have different cultures based upon where the building is. And I do think one thing charters do that, that our public schools, that traditional public schools don't often do, is they're willing to be flexible, they're willing to mirror the area they're in. Well, I don't think that's a bad thing. 
why, why is that so frowned upon by people who say charters are bad? Well, you know, there's a, I, I call them the, the used to committee. That's not how we used to do it. <laughs> you know, the status quo, whatever you, there's a, people like, people are, are not into change always. But I think that when you're talking about students, children and learning, recognizing all kids need different things. Right. And to have the freedom to create, like mm -hmm. you said, learning spaces that meet the needs of those students, we should be doing more of that. We should bust up all these districts and everything else. I would love to see more regional options for mm -hmm. parents, where again, a parent is getting to engage in a choice of education. A school is getting to make decisions as close to students as possible without all the prescriptive nature of the politics and the policies. Tell me what the standard is. What do you expect me to get done with families, with, with students? Mm -hmm. Get out of the way and let me do it. And I think that's how we treat business. And right. the fact is, is when a business doesn't attract customers, you shut the it doors. It goes away. And you let another person step in and do that. And people don't always like that about charter schools right. but I think it's a I think it's a formula that actually works on behalf of students mm -hmm. and less about grown-ups you know I hold teachers in the same regard as law enforcement officers and members of the military because of the importance of what they do I mean it really is very important you let someone be around your child seven eight hours a day I don't know how you can't see them as being important right and grade the way teachers are perceived right now in your opinion, and then what can we do to make people understand the importance of their job? I think the pandemic has actually helped the teaching profession because I think when kids had to stay home and parents had a responsibility for the education, they're like, wait a minute, I love my teacher, and all of a sudden I recognize like this is critical, and I think you're absolutely right. Teachers are they're with our future right. and how we would not respect them and hold them in a place of honor like you said military police but you know engineers mm -hmm. architects lawyers teachers should be right there and that means paying them a salary that's yep. not embarrassing yep. but also holding teachers accountable for what's going on in the classroom it works 100%. both ways um, but I believe that the teaching profession is one of the most honorable professions I'm I don't think I would be a good teacher and I think that's really important to recognize I think all kids can learn yep I do not believe all people can teach no. and those that are teaching <laughs> we should support them fully both in their own professional development the resources they need to do their job but most importantly to trust that they know what they're doing and yeah. let them do it. So when you go down to the legislature or go to Bessie or come to school board members, I know everybody's terrified because you're coming in there, but you know, take people inside of those rooms when the discussion is happening. I got about a minute. And yeah, describe it's real simple. Yeah. We don't talk about children that much or mm -hmm. kids. We talk about contracts, we talk about money, we talk about test scores, we talk about a lot of things that are not focused on how are the students doing? Right. How are our kids doing? That's very, I've sat through hours of school board meetings or even Bessie meetings where the word child, student, doesn't get used. And so again, refocusing on what it is we're trying to accomplish, I think is really important. So you got to come back in January or somewhere near the middle of the school year and give us a grade on all this stuff. Will you Love do it? To. Yeah. All right, next week we update you on what's been happening around Louisiana with the coronavirus and Gordy Rush might come back. I'm thinking about it. I'm gonna flip the coin until it comes up on the side where he's not coming back but you'll find out next week here on The Clay Young Show. Have a great weekend. Go Jags, go Tigers.